This is HuffPost Live. I'm Ricky Camilleri. This week, the FBI seized control of the darknet marketplace known as Silk Road 2.0, which reportedly trafficked more than $8 million worth of drugs each month. The FBI has also apprehended who they believe to be the operator of the site, Blake Benthal. It's expected that more deep web marketplaces will be shut down by the authorities soon, but many more are expected to pop up in their wake. So as America begins to re-examine their tactics in the war on drugs on the ground, is it using the same old tactics when it comes to the web? Joining us to discuss, we have Alex Winter, director of the documentary Deep Web, and Christopher Ingraham, writer at the Washington Post. Guys, thanks so much for joining me. Hello. Hey, Ricky. How you doing? Good. Good to have you, Alex. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, you too. Chris, let's start with you. Uh, what do we know about yesterday's seizures and uh, Silk Road 2.0 administrator Blake Benthal? Well, the big thing is the, the, the headline there is they seized Silk Road 2.0. They also seized a number of smaller darknet markets. We got some more word about marketplaces seized today. Overall, if you look at the total number of transactions on these things, the FBI shut down sites representing probably a little less than half of all darknet commerce, which overall big picture makes this slightly less of an impact than the original Silk Road seizure, which was back in October of last year. Back in October of, of last year. But what do we know about uh, Blake, otherwise known as DEF CON? Yeah, he's a pretty interesting guy, right? Uh, so basically, the FBI is trying to paint him as this master criminal. Uh, but basically, this is a kid who, he's a young guy. He works for SpaceX. He's basically a kid who loves to code. Um, he, uh, he used his profits on the site to put a down payment on a Tesla car. Um, so basically, all that we really see about him is that he, you know, he's he's a coder, he's a bit of a nerd, and he cares about his carbon footprint. So you kind of have to question the uh, the wisdom of putting somebody like this behind bars for the rest of their life, which is what the FBI is trying to do. There's, they, he could face a minimum of ten years or the rest of his life. How can these charges add up to a a life sentence? Well, what you've got is you, you have the narcotics trafficking charge, which is the big one. That has a man mandatory minimum of 10 years. So if he gets convicted on that, it's at least 10 years. And then there are all these other ancillary charges as well. So when you add them all together, depending on what kind of case the FBI can build against him, that could easily end up to, add up to life. Can we honestly say that he deserves life in prison for the crimes that he committed? Or is the FBI trying to use him as an example to say to uh, other possible dark, uh, dark market operators, we will put you in jail for life because they clearly can't shut them all down, right? That, that's correct. And they're, they're obviously trying to use him as an example here. And they're actually doing a pretty bad job in terms of who they selected to prosecute here. These marketplaces, they all have kind of different guiding philosophies behind them. In Silk Road 2.0s, it was very strictly, they were saying, we will not be involved in crimes that have a victim. We will only uh, traffic in drugs and a couple of other things. Where you have these other marketplaces, they're dealing with stolen credit cards, identity fraud, weapons. So they really picked kind of the, uh, you know, the most uh, the, the most friendly of the bunch. So they're really not making a, a good case here, I'd say. Well, would you say that it's, uh, and Alex, I'm going to go to you in just a second. I know you're sitting in the car uh, waiting to jump in here. But would you say that the reason they went after Blake Benthal is because he kind of made it easy? I mean, he, he basically uh, signed up onto the server with his personal email account, right? Yeah, I mean, he, uh, it looks like Blake made some uh, some kind of uh, pretty simple mistakes, like signing up to the server with his Gmail account. Uh, the the complaint against him indicates that Google turned over some information about his uh, email activity, um, and the the complaint also indicates that their undercover agent who was behind this had access starting from the very inception of Silk Road 2.0 way back in last year. So this has kind of been in the cards for a long time, from the very beginning of that site. I want to backtrack a little bit, Alex. You are, as I said, directing a documentary uh, about the deep web. Take me back to the Dread Pirate, Robert, uh, Dread Pirate Roberts days. What happened there with Silk Road 1.0? Um, you know, well, in brief, um, you know, the reality is that, uh, you know, you had the, these technologies, um, you know, leading up through cryptography, through Bitcoin, um, and what the the kind of the genius, if you want to call that, um, of the Silk Road 1.0 was was taking cryptography, Bitcoin, and a kind of uh, free market uh, ethos or philosophy, if you will, which is very uh, typical of many cryptographers and many people in new internet uh, movements, um, and built a free market. And you have to remember that the Silk Road wasn't built. Um, just to sell drugs. It was built philosophically as a free market, something that, that people could utilize and join as a community 
um, and you know, outside the jurisdiction of you know governments and and their laws and their oversight. Frankly, um, you know, that was shut down. Uh, there were a lot of arrests made uh, around Silk Road One. Uh, many vendors, many moderators. Uh, Ross Albrecht, as you probably know, is is being accused of being the Dread Pirate Roberts and has been uh, pretty vilified in the media, um, you know, uh, not having actually been found guilty of anything yet. Well, yeah, he's um, not just not just as the operator of this, but they're also saying that he conspired uh, to commit murder, to hire hitmen. That's one of the accusations against him that was definitely thrown around in the media quite often. Yes, and, and of course, um, and anyone who's following this case knows that he wasn't actually charged with any of those murders. So, you know, there was, uh, to, to Chris's point, uh, there was a great deal of effort made to paint a picture of, you know, the people involved in these, in these situations uh, or that are being alleged to be involved in these situations are murderous, you know, sort of Walter White drug kingpins, um, when in fact uh, what we do know of most of these people is that uh, they're actually uh, primarily motivated by reducing violence and harm uh, within the drug community, uh, when it involves drugs at all, they're in, in, you know, very interested in creating free markets. They're interested in using technology to to have sort of private lives online. Um, and, uh, you know, so, you know, for a lot of these kids, you know, in their 20s that are facing life in jail, um, you know, hey, you have to ask yourself exactly what the end game is here. Now, that's a, I think there's a nobility that you can prescribe to uh, with Ross, because essentially Ross may have made a lot of money off of uh, Silk Road 1.0, but he apparently didn't spend it, right? Whereas we have with Blake, he was trying to purchase a $70,000 Tesla model. He was clearly using the money. He was profiting from this uh, market that he created, whereas from what we know about Ross, he, he wasn't necessarily using his profits, right? Yeah, and you know, and again, I want to be really careful because it's a slippery slope, and I think the media, um, you know, in in a lot of instances, has unwittingly done the prosecution's job by continually calling Ross the Dread Pirate Roberts, which which he claims he isn't, mm -hmm. and we have no evidence. You know, I have I've been embedded in the Silk Road for a couple of years. I know everybody involved in my sources are very high up the food chain within the Silk Road community, and uh, it's pretty evident to most of us that our uh, versed in these issues, that there were many Dread Pirate Roberts, that this was a community-run organization. And um, so, you know, I don't know what Ross was doing other than that, um, you know, according to the criminal complaints, he had a lot of Bitcoin, but he lived a very Spartan existence. And what we do know about him, he certainly was never a money-oriented person. You know, but I do want to qualify that I don't think that makes Blake, you know, more deserving of a of a maximum time in jail because he, you know, he was a fan of Elon Musk. I mean, I think that that you know, that's not a good enough reason either to vilify somebody. I think that we need to be careful and measured to not, you know, hang these people by the highest tree before they're, they're found guilty of anything. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think uh, we, yeah. I, could, I could probably do better at using the word allegedly as we, <laughs> as we talk about him. Another thing, though, you mentioned that there were several Dread Pirate Roberts, potentially, uh, when it came to Silk Road 1.0. There was a, a, apparently a Dread Pirate Roberts 2 when it came to Silk Road 2.0, who is still at large. Do you think it's possible, uh, just speculating, that that DPR2 could be one of the DPRs of Silk Road 1.0? Look, I hate to demystify something that has been given a lot of mystification, um, but it's my understanding, uh, and I feel fairly confident about this because of the, the number of sources that I have, that there are many Dread Pirate Roberts. That's that's the gag. That's why the Dread Pirate Roberts name was invented. The whole point of the Dread Pirate Roberts is that it's a name that gets passed to person to person to person. Um, while Silk Road One was up, I'm aware that there were four or five people using the Dread Pirate Roberts um, user account to uh, to administrate that site. Um, so you know you're dealing with you know it's very similar to Napster and the Napster effect, where you're dealing with a community. Um, and generally, the media and and the the sort of law enforcement reaction to that is to try to find one person, go, you're the bad guy. Once we get you, it's all over. But there is no there is no one person. This is a this is a, a community of millions of people that has been growing exponentially since the birth of the internet, and it's going to keep growing. 
I want to pull up a quick comment right now from uh, Nikon who says it is at least as hard and possible to control as the in-person drug market. 3.0 has been here for a year or more, as have 4.0, 5.0, and so on. Now, Chris, shortly after the news broke, you wrote a blog post titled How the FBI Just Made the World a More Dangerous Place by Shutting Down Silk Road 2.0 and a bunch of other online drug markets. Can you explain to me now uh, how exactly it made the world more dangerous? Sure. Well, what Silk Road and these other markets do is that they take these drug transactions, these drug sales, and they take them off the street corner where they're typically associated with a lot of violence. Uh, you know, as you mentioned earlier, just think of Walter White, think of The Wire, and they put them online. Um, so you're really taking a lot of violence off the streets. And that's one of the big kind of harm reduction things that these markets do. And there are several researchers at various universities who have done some studies on this and have found this to be the case. The other thing is that it makes the world, having these online markets makes the world a much safer place for drug users. If you look at the numbers of the drugs being sold, uh, particularly on Silk Road 2.0, ecstasy is one of the most popular ones. And many of these drugs that are being sold, they're of very high quality and they're not really adulterated by a lot of the chemicals and the dangerous contaminants that you see on a lot of street drugs. And so that's, it's, it's, ending up with a lot fewer deaths for drug users. Is that, the, are, there, are, there, are there facts to back that up? Where, where could I are, see these drugs being? There are studies. There, there are studies. I could send you some. Yeah, okay. there's a recent one just done this year. I believe it came out of the University of Montreal. And look, the FBI itself and its complaints has said that they've tested the drug samples coming out of these sites and they found them to be incredibly pure. Um, so that's part of it. And the other thing going on is that these sites, they, they kind of run on the notion of reviews. And most of these sellers have... Uh, reviews, just like Amazon. And what that does is it really makes the sellers accountable to the users. Um, so that puts a lot of more power in the drug users and it helps them ensure that they're getting a much safer product. Do you guys, do you guys know how I, how I log on to these sites, by the way? Just, just out of curiosity, I want to check out these uh, high purity drugs right now. Um, <laughs> Alex, when the FBI announced the seizure of Silk Road 2.0 and the rest of uh, Blake Benthal on Tuesday, they warned, quote, those looking to follow in the footsteps of alleged cyber criminals should understand that we will return as many times as necessary to shut down noxious online criminal bazaars. We don't get tired. But new markets keep popping up, right? The FBI keeps shutting them down. Then what? Is there any conclusion to this at all? Is this literally just the drug war 2.0? Yeah, I think that that uh, there are two significant issues involved in the Silk Road drug um, story. One is a prohibition story, as Chris was alluding to, which is what is the drug war doing? What is its purpose? Uh, who are its victims? And um, and should laws be reformed to start to roll back, um, you know, some of the punitive aspects of of the drug war, um, which you know just happened in California a couple of days ago with Proposition 47. Um, you know, then there's a civil rights question, which is which is a much broader has much broader implications, which is, you know, if we start to use these open bazaars as precedent to search and seize, you know, um, uh, there's a lot of questions around how both of the servers were found, both for 1.0 and 2.0. Um, if these uh, cases become precedent for rolling back more of our rights online, more of uh, the individual freedom, that's a problem. Um, and that has absolute implications for all of us. And I think that we have to kind of look at both of those issues as we look at these cases. Regarding the drug markets themselves, it's, it is like Napster. I mean, you could, you could jump up and down and say, yeah, we got Kazaa, yeah, we got LimeWire. Well, the reality of it is, is we're moving, just like Napster, we're moving from a centralized system into a decentralized system. You know, we're moving uh, the, the, the five or six markets that were shut down over the last two days were among the smallest and least um, respected. Nobody that I know was using Silk Road 2.0. Nobody took it seriously. Didn't use escrow, didn't use trustless mixing, didn't use a lot of the new technologies that, that people are using uh, to circumvent you know, being caught. So uh, the, the really robust markets have been untouched and there are new ones coming up every day. And there are decentralized markets that are gonna be just like the days of BitTorrent, impossible to shut down. So none of this is going away. It's a game of cat and mouse that's going to go on until we have, you know, legal reform around the drug war. And we understand that the technological era is changing the world at a rapid pace in many ways that will not be able to be stopped. Is it fair to say that essentially the Silk Road and the uh, online drug marketplaces are just a byproduct of the war on drugs just as much as gang violence is? 
No, I don't. I mean, I think I think sure it's a reaction to the war on drugs on a certain level that a lot of people. I mean, Richard Branson made a great comment about this the other day that, you know, drug use to a large degree is, is a mental health issue, and the drug war prevents us from being able to treat it as a mental health issue, which is which is inhumane and it's a problem and that needs to be dealt with. Um, but I do think that it would be a mistake to characterize the open markets, the free markets, or if you want to call them the black markets, as drug markets because. Their philosophy of creating them, just like Sean Fanning didn't create Napster to steal music, he created it to create a global community. Whether you agree with that or like it, it happens to be a fact. And it gave, paved the way for Facebook and everything else. In a similar way, Silk Road 1.0 was created with a philosophy of creating an open market, not because of, about drugs. Drug was, drugs were a, a, a tool, as it were, to create the community. Um, but the community is what matters. And if you overlook that, you're actually overlooking the most important component of why these markets will not be able to be stopped, because that's their primary motive is to create these alternative communities, not just to get, you know, coke easier. Fair enough. I mean, on the Silk Road uh, homepage, it read, quote, Silk Road is not a marketplace. Silk Road is a global revolt. revolt. The idea of freedom is immortal. Chris, do you... Is it fair to believe to be a little bit cynical and to think that these political motivations, these revolts, were a bit of a smokescreen for the ability to sell and 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 purchase drugs with a, a little more ease than than you can on the street? Um, I wouldn't say that at all. Uh, I mean, so the thing about drugs, the, the dr there's just a constant demand of drugs. It's a simple fact of life that a certain that a certain percentage of people in any given society are going to use drugs and they're going to get them however they can. Uh, they're going to go down the street to their deal around the corner. They're going to get them online. And what we found over 30 years of the drug war is that trying to tackle the problem from the supply end of things by shutting down dealers, by shutting down growers, that that really hasn't changed demand for drugs at all. It hasn't changed use rates. It hasn't changed addiction rates. And what it's done instead is created a very violent black market. So what we're starting to see, particularly in the last few years, even in Congress, is we're starting to see some acknowledgement of this. We're starting to see that um, people are getting tired of these uh, drug war excesses, like these uh, stiff mandatory minimum sentences, which are starting to be rolled back. Um, and even places like the DEA and the Office of National Drug Control Policy, they're starting to take a different approach to drugs. They're starting to focus more on the demand side to ask why are people using these drugs? Can we get people more treatment? Um, all of which most people agree is a pretty positive development. But then on the other hand, you have the FBI here kind of parading around and thumping their chest over the, this uh, single arrest. And it's really a throwback to the 80s drug war days. And it seems like they really didn't get the memo about the drug war and supply reduction. Absolutely. As, as we said, essentially at the beginning, it seems as though the shutting down of these marketplaces and the using them as um, as examples to stop more does seem like tactics of the 80s drug war, war rather than what we're seeing now in the sort of re-examining of this drug war. That's correct. And it's funny because it really stands in sharp contrast to what we just saw in the midterm elections where you had two states plus a district legalizing marijuana. You have several municipalities legalizing marijuana. As Alex mentioned, you have Prop 47 out in California, which did a a lot of work in reforming sentences. So you see, uh, you see a, a big sea change among the general public. The elites, the lawmakers, they are slower to catch on, but they are starting to catch on. And then you still do have some of these agencies like the FBI and the DEA, where these changing attitudes on drugs and drug use are really something of an existential threat to them because there are these huge bureaucracies built up around the idea that drugs are bad and that we must stop them. So there's, you're gonna see some more resistance like this at, from the FBI and from these levels. But really, most of the change is happening at the popular level, and I think that's going to continue to drive it. Final question, Alex, and uh, we got to make it quick, but do you think this is less about drugs and shutting down drug marketplaces and more about shutting down free markets? Absolutely. I actually would, I would go so far as to say that the greatest threat um, to you know, the uh, establishment and to establish laws is not the, the, the actually comparatively tiny amount of drugs that are being sold uh, via these markets compared to the larger cartels and the big fish that the feds uh, customarily go over. I would say that the real threat, the real reason there's such uh, punishment being doled out, whether it's to Ross Ulbricht, whether it's to Aaron Swartz, whether it's to Barrett Brown, whether it's to Jeremy Hammond, I think that you're dealing with a uh, pushback against a movement um, that is seeking greater liberation, uh, greater individual rights, and the, the internet is an extraordinary tool 
And it can't be stopped because, you know, the Internet is now woven into banking. It's woven into the way our uh, all of our technological, all of our systems function. Um, and so cryptographers and hackers and, you know, journalists and dissidents are always going to be able to find ways to use the Internet to uh, convene and commune uh, privately and anonymously. I think that's a great threat. And I think that is primarily why we see such punishment being doled out. Alex, Chris, uh, thanks so much for joining me, having this conversation. Great talk, guys. Thanks, guys. No thanks. Thank you. Keep watching HuffPost Live. We've got a lot more great conversations coming up.